Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, everyone, as we continue our series, Rejoicing Hope, here at Elam Seventh-day Adventist Church in St. Petersburg. We are glad that you can join us again tonight as we are getting ready to receive the blessing of the Lord. Amen. Very happy to be here. I'm very happy that I'm getting a lot of uh, 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 friend requests. I've been getting a lot of people that are already in my social media. Um, it surprises me because people that I have there that I have not chat with in the past are actually chatting with me now, asking for prayers and, um, and, um, and praying for me for this series that we are conducting. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I'm also happy because it is by the power of the Lord that we're able to be here to share the word of God with you. And today I want to share something very personal with you. I wrote a letter to my beautiful wife, Evelyn, a beautiful, my beautiful wife of 35 years. And, and I wrote her a letter and I want to share this letter that I wrote for her. So I truly hope she doesn't mind. Here we go. Dear Evelyn, did I ever tell you what a beautiful woman you are? When I say beautiful, it is not only the outward appearance, but also your amazing personality and kind heart. I am glad you are my wife. And sometimes I wonder, what have I done to have you in my life? I am truly madly and deeply in love with you. You showered me with unconditional love and were there for me through all my ups and downs. You are a woman stronger than anyone I know. Thank you for everything you do for me. You are an angel sent from above. I know you will be surprised upon this letter. Yes, it is real. Because of you, I no longer feel alone. Because of you, I look forward to walking, waking up each day just to look at your face. Because of you, my family is complete. I still remember the first time we met. You were so beautiful that my heart melted. Your eyes were sparkling like stars. Your hair was perfectly on your face. I was all sweaty and nervous when you passed by me. That day I decided there is not a thing I would change in you because you are amazing just the way you are. No one can replace you in my life. You are the love of my life, darling. I will never let you go. You probably would not know, but I cannot stay away from you. I go crazy if you do not talk to me. Every time we fight, I could be putting a brave face but deep inside, I curse myself for raising my voice at you. I love your smile. The way your eyes light up upon seeing me makes me feel like I am the king of the world. There are other women out there, but I'm sure no one will be able to change my world as you did 35 years ago when you stole my heart. And please never return it because it is the only place it wants to be. You are not only habits. I can tell you anything and be myself whenever I am tired of fighting my way in this world. It is your presence that gives me peace. I feel proud when my friends envy our relationship. We do not fight about who is more or less between us because we both know how important we are to each other. The best part of our relationship is we both understand each other's unspoken thoughts. I will love you forever, my sweetheart. Truly yours forever, Puchunguito. Uh, that name Puchunguito, is, it's an inside name that we, we actually called each other. But what a beautiful letter, right? It is amazing how we humans find a way in words to express our love to someone, right? I, I, just, I just made this letter from my wife. I wanted to share with you in... Um, it, there's some, some really big words there, right? And, and we could write a letter also not just to our wives. We can write it vice versa to our husbands. We can write a, a letter to our sons, to our daughters. 
um, just letting them know how much we care for them and, and how we feel about them. Well, in tonight's message, we're going to find out that God also sent us a love letter. That's right. God sent us a love letter in the form of his Ten Commandments, in the form of his regulations that we find in the Bible. It is in the, it is in the, in the way that God expresses towards us. Now, some people may think that this letter is really not a love letter. It's a hate letter. It, it's, it's a letter from someone who's kind of bossy. But the fact is that we're going to find out throughout the message tonight that it is, in fact, a love letter. See, when we go, from, when we go from back in time to the beginning of time, we see that the, the loving obedience has always been a test of loyalty to God. Always. Our obedience has always been a way of us showing God that we love him. And we found out already in past studies that Lucifer... He, he, he lied and deceived one-third of the angels to disobey God. It's, 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 it's the reverse of God, what God wants from us. Lucifer was claiming that God's government was unfair, and he still claims that today. He's, he's claiming that his laws were unjust and that his laws are still unjust today. Satan painted a picture of God as an authoritarian ruler who had little interest in his creation, and that is a big lie because God is really, really interested in you. He is really interested in your salvation, and we have been going through a lot of things that God has done for us to show how much he loves us. One of the things that he did that I don't think he can do any more than that is, is he gave his son to die in our place. So his son, Jesus, took the place that really belonged to us because as we've already learned, we are the ones who sinned. We are the ones who lived away from God and God lived the perfect life. So the perfect life that God lived, he exchanged it and he gave it to us. So God really, really loves us. And this love letter is a way of him expressing, expressing his love towards us. His claim has always been that obedience limits our happiness. This, these are the claims of Satan, and it is not true. And he claims that disobedience enhances life. We know that's not true. He perpetrated the lie in heaven when he lied to the angels, and he perpetrated the lie in Eden when he lied to Adam and Eve. In tonight's message, we will discover that the obedience to God law will bring the greatest joy. That's right. You heard correctly. Obedience to God law will bring us the greatest joy, will bring us the greatest peace, will bring us the greatest safety and the highest delight in God's people as we have and, 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 and establish a relationship with God of trust and a relationship with God of love. We will also discover the amazing truth that God not only calls us to obey his commandments and his law, but he also gives us the power to obey. Now, we've been talking about in the past how God has given us his Holy Spirit. Remember, we talked about Jesus had to leave, go to heaven, and he said, it, must, it is necessary for me to go because if I do not go, the, the counselor could not be here, right? We're talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is the power that is in us that gives us the ability to do things according to the will of God. Can you imagine, you know, we live in the society that we live today. To, to New Jersey, to the States. I was probably in the age of seven or eight. I do have good memory of this. And we used to live in a neighborhood that people would actually, pastor, would, would go to sleep with the doors open at night. I, I don't know if any of you ever lived in that type of neighborhood, but I'm talking in the early 70s, right? This was, this was back when crime wasn't as bad as it is now. So just imagine if we live in a world of crime and, and we need the laws, Imagine if we didn't have these laws. You know, it is with the laws and the crime is at a level that it is right now. Imagine if we didn't have laws. Imagine if we didn't have laws, traffic laws. You'd be having accidents in every corner because we know we're always in a rush and we always want to get through the intersection first. So, so just imagine that. That's the reason why God, centuries ago, gave us his law. He wrote it with his own hands. And the Bible says that we're still supposed to keep it today. We're still supposed to keep his law. So violating any part of God's law always brings us negative consequences. 
Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this week that you have given us. Thank you for bringing us to church and to social media in front of our, our TVs, our, our apparatus that we are watching this, uh, this message tonight. We, we praise you. We honor you, Father, because you have been a good God to us the entire week. We ask you, Lord, that you forgive our sins. And we ask you as we continue to proclaim your word as we talk tonight about that love letter that you gave us, your Ten Commandments and your, your statutes and your regulations in the Holy Scripture, that you open our hearts and our minds and you can help us to understand that it is not a load, but it is a way of us to having a perfect, loving, peaceful relationship with you. Some people do not understand this, Lord. That's why we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you give us this understanding. Once more, Lord, hide me behind the cross of let people see not me, but see you as we open your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we talk about law, it is necessary for us to also talk about grace. We can't talk about law without talking about grace. The doctrine of law and grace is misunderstood by many Christians today. And there's two groups of people. One group is, is, is the group that says that salvation is by grace and grace alone. And Christians are no longer required to keep the law. I'm going to say it again. There's a group that says that salvation is by grace and grace alone. And Christians are no longer required to keep the law. There's another group that says that salvation is by grace, but Christians are still required to obey God's law. I'm going to say it again. There's another group that says that Christians are saved by grace, but they are still required to obey God's law. Now, many people, however, misunderstand the second group because they say that salvation is by grace, but grace comes only if they obey God's law. And this is not true because if you do something to try to earn salvation, that is called salvation by works. And, it's, and so, so you can't have salvation by works and have salvation by grace. First of all, salvation by works doesn't exist. It is only by grace. By the word law, those who say that Christians are no longer required to keep the law actually refer to the law of the Sabbath and some of the, of the laws of the food and drink that we find in the book of Leviticus. Some say that the seventh-day Sabbath is for the Jews. We're going to discover that tonight. Some say that is for the Jews, and some are others' laws about what not to eat or drink. To understand the issue better, we need to understand what is sin. So we're going to kind of break this down a little bit for you. We want to understand what is sin, what is the law, the role of grace and faith in the process of salvation. First of all, if you look at the screen, what is sin? 1 John 3, 4 says the following. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. Sin is transgression of the law. I'm going to read it again. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. So sin is a transgression of the law. If you break the law, that means that you, you, you did what? You committed sin, right? Because you broke the law. Whatever the law is, if you broke it, you committed sin. So if sin is breaking the law, it means that without law, there's no sin. So some people said that, that the law is not for us, it's for the Jews, right? Especially when they talk about the Sabbath. We're going to talk about the Sabbath this weekend. But it's just an example, right? You, you, you're responsible for all ten, right? So if, if there is no law, there is no sin. Because sin is transgression of the law. So if you say that there is no law any longer uh, over the cross or after the cross, it means that there is no sinners. And that's not true. Because there are sinners. We are sinners. I am a sinner. right? So this is untrue. Sin is also defined as the unbelief in God. Disobedience and rebellion against God. That's the same thing that Lucifer did in heaven, right? So disobedience and rebellion against God for which we are all born. Why? Because Adam and Eve did it. They sinned. They transgressed against God. And, and, and we inherited that, right? We inherited that condemnation from Adam and Eve. Now, we already found out what sin is, right? Sin is when we transgress the law. We break the law, we sin. So there has to be a law because if there was no law, there'd be no sin, right? Okay, we got that clear. What is grace? Ephesians 2.8 says, 
For by grace, you are saved through faith. For by grace, you are saved through faith in that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. So grace is God's benevolent kindness. Listen to this. It, the grace is God's benevolent kindness that is given based upon his goodness. And it doesn't matter who the recipient is. It doesn't matter the condition of the recipient. It doesn't matter if you're Hispanic, Black, Chinese, Puerto Rican. It doesn't matter. Grace is something that is given from God because he loves us so much. Okay? So that's important that we remember this. Okay? Grace is God choosing to save us and bless us rather than destroy us because the destruction is what we deserve. I'm trying to explain this in a manner that you can understand it. Okay? So grace is something that God has given us instead of giving us what we deserve. We understand? Say amen. Amen, right? So grace is a gift from God. It is something undeserved. It is, it is something in place of what we truly deserve. So the only way of uh, uh, any of us can enter into a relationship with God is because of his grace, grace towards us. Amen. Grace began in the Garden of Eden when God killed an animal to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. And we find that in Genesis 3.21. He could have killed the first humans right there and then. He could have just said, you know what? I, 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 this is not going well. It, it, it didn't go well in heaven. It's not going well here on earth. He could have just decided to kill them all. But he didn't. Why? Because he gave them his grace. He chose to make a way for them to be right with him. Right? Grace is God choosing a way for us to be right with him. Tonight, we're trying to explain this to you so you can understand that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how your life has been from today backwards. From the moment you were born till, till today, which is the 14th, right? Today's the 14th of, of October. Whatever date it is, because my days are off. But from the moment you were born until today, it doesn't matter how your how your past has been, because God is trying to find a make is is making a way for you to be right with Him. So the pattern of grace continued throughout the Old Testament when God instituted the blood sacrifices as a mean of atonement to sinful men, and we find that in Leviticus chapter sixteen. It was not the physical blood of those sacrifices that cleansed the sinners. It was the grace of God that forgave those who trusted in him and demonstrated their faith in sacrificing those animals. So they sacrificed the animal, but the animal was not the one that actually um, forgave the sin that they have because the animal was a, was a type of the antitype that was to come, right? So sinful men show their faith by offering the sacrifice that God required. In turn, God shows both mercy and grace. God shows both mercy and grace. However, they're not the same. Mercy is not the same as grace. Let's pay attention to this, please. Mercy withholds a punishment we deserve. That's what mercy is. Right? Grace gives us pardon and a blessing that we do not deserve. So both of them, we don't deserve it, but God loves us so much. Remember, the emphasis tonight is God loves, right? God loves us so much that he gave us this love letter, right? Because he wants to find a way for you and I to have a good relationship with him, regardless of what anyone has to say. It doesn't matter what social media has to say. It doesn't matter what any religion has to say, because what matters is what the word of God has to say. But, you know, fortunately for you, God is using us, the Seventh-day Adventist church, to tell you how God wants to have that relationship with you. And we're using the word to tell you that, right? So mercy withholds the punishment. And grace is the pardon that God gives you that you don't deserve. If you break the law, for example, let's say I committed a sin. Pastor Perez committed a sin. And yes, I sinned because I'm not perfect. So I commit a sin, but I recognize that I sinned. So I, I, I go and I pray to God and I ask for his mercy. Follow me. You make a mistake. You have been living a life um, away from God. You have been li uh, living a life, like we say in Spanish, la, la vida loca, right? The crazy life, 
You have been living the crazy life, but you have been realizing in the series, right, that God is touching your heart. God is talking to you. And you're like undecided. You don't know what you want to do. But you find out that you really want to repent of your sins. So you come to God. You can do it tonight. You can do it right now as I'm talking. In your mind, you say, God, forgive me. I want that mercy. So as you ask forgiveness, as I ask forgiveness, immediately because God loves me, because he loves you, he gives me mercy. He gives you mercy. What that is, is he pardons us, right? He gives me mercy. He forgives me, right? So now for me to be completely cleansed of my sin, he has to give me something else. He has to give me his grace, right? Because grace is the pardon. Mercy is, is the punishment that he's stopping from giving. So he doesn't punish me because I'm asking for mercy. Can we say an amen? Can we, we understand that, right? We're asking for mercy so he doesn't give us the punishment. So he, but, but then on top of the mercy, he gives us his grace. He gives us pardon and blessings that we don't deserve. In mercy, God chooses to cancel our sin debt by sacrificing his perfect son on our place. Titus 3.5, 2 Corinthians 5.21. But he does even further than mercy and extends grace to his enemies, to us, right? Because God, the Bible says that even before we were, when we were his enemies, Jesus died for us, right? So he gives us his mercy and he gives us his grace. He offers us forgiveness, reconciliation, abundant life, eternal treasure, his Holy Spirit, and a place in heaven with him someday. And that's what we're here for, to offer you that better place, which is heaven someday. And it's going to be very, very soon. If we accept his offer and place our faith in his sacrifice, all you have to do is offer an answer to his calling. That's all you have to do. You don't have to change anything. You don't even have to try to change anything. We mentioned this before. You have to come to God. You have to come to Jesus as you are. As you are. You ask for forgiveness. He shows you mercy. Gives you forgiveness, right? He shows you his grace. So what's the purpose of the law? Because tonight's message is about the Ten Commandments, right? So what is the purpose of the law? The, the, the word law includes the seven-day Sabbath, and it also includes other statutes and, 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 and regulations that we find in the Bible, right? But we're talking specifically tonight about the Ten Commandments, right? Given to, to Moses in Mount Sinai, and we find that in Exodus 20. But it started in the creation when God created the Sabbath. We find this in Genesis 2, 2. And when God instructed Adam and Eve, not to eat of the fruit of, of the forbidden tree. Tonight, we're not going to emphasize on the Sabbath because we have a study on the Sabbath this weekend. Tonight, we just want to emphasize on the commandments. First of all, God's law serves three purposes. We're going to go over them real quick. Firstly, to maintain order and harmony in his kingdom. Secondly, for the citizens of God's kingdom to prove their obedience and loyalty to him. And thirdly, to show direction and standard. So before I move forward, let me review real quick what we just went by. We must understand, and it's very important, that you are saved by grace. You are saved by grace. It is a gift of God. There is nothing that you have to do for God to save you. All you have to do is tonight give yourself to the Lord. Ask for forgiveness. He will show you mercy and he will show you grace. We just went through it with the Bible. That's the first thing we need to get out of the way to understand. Because we're going to talk about the law now. And the law has something to do with, with our relationship with God. right? But we want you to understand that it's only by grace that you are saved. But, but the law has to be obeyed. Okay? First of all, to maintain order and harmony in his kingdom. The universe, including the earth, is God's household. We understand that because he owns everything, right? We are his family. His laws are the household rules for his children and for us, for us to, to behave. So God, God, this is the house of God. We come into his kingdom and he's got rules. We mentioned a little bit ago, imagine living in a world where there is no law. 
you know, you, you, it's, it's just unbearable. You know, you, you, you can't even imagine. I don't want to imagine living in that kind of world. I want the traffic light rules. I want the stop sign. I want the yield sign. I want the, the you, you can't commit crime. You can't sell drugs. Like, I want all those rules because it makes my neighborhood, my community safer. So God's commandments maintains order and harmony inside the kingdom. Because even, even though that the world takes uh, from the commandments to do their rule, because there is a law in this nation that says you can't kill someone, right? If you kill someone, unless it's self-defense, you will go to prison. So where did they get that from? They got that from the Ten Commandments. So, But we're talking about the kingdom of God. You come, you accept God, right? So now you are part of his kingdom. But you can't, you can't accept salvation and you can't say, I want to walk with Jesus, but live your life the way you want to. You, you, it's, 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 that's not the way it works. I gave myself to God, Pastor Perez. I gave myself to the Lord. And there's a lot of things that I still don't understand. But I choose to obey God because I am grateful for what he has done for me. And even though there's things that I don't understand, I accept them because I love him and he is my God. And I know that these rules are, are for me to have a good harmony with God. And that's what I want you to understand. Because as you start making decisions to come into the kingdom of God, not, not just to be part of our church, because we want you to be part of the kingdom. Some people are in the church and they go back out. We want you to be in the kingdom and stay in the kingdom. Amen? So... The first thing is, is to maintain harmony in God's kingdom, right? Keeping his laws does not make us his children, right? We become his children by believing in him, right? As explained in the process of, of salvation that we're going to touch in a little bit before we finish. Keeping the law of God is simple, being a law-abiding child of God. That's all it is. I accept Jesus as my personal savior. He is my Lord and King, and I do his will. And I, and, and I obey him, and that's what the law does for me, right? Obeying God's law does not earn me any favors with God. Because God loves me, period. It earns me a better relationship with God, most definitely. But it keeps you obedient, right? And, and at the same time, when you obey his law, you can appreciate his mercy and his grace. Because that's what I do. I'm sharing what, how I feel and what the Bible teaches me. So as I obey God and I keep his laws, uh, and some laws are easier than others to keep, right? Because I'm sure none of us walk around, get up in the morning with the intention of killing someone, right? No one does. Um, I, I, no one walks around with the intention of committing adultery that day. At least I don't, Right? But there's other laws like the seventh day Sabbath, which we're going to touch this 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 uh, this weekend. There's laws of, of of things that God requires and says we should and should not eat. Those laws like that, stuff that that is that is is hard because we are so accustomed to not obeying these laws. But God is calling you tonight, and He's telling you that as you obey His laws, because His laws bring. Um, harmony in his kingdom, you're going to have a better relationship with God. Because we don't want you to be in the kingdom and be, and be sad. We want you to be in the kingdom and we want you to be happy. Mark 12, 30, 31 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is, the second of this is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So when we look at these commandments, the first four bring harmony between us and God. The first four commandments. If we obey them, and in the, in the, in the, in the first four commandments is the fourth commandment about the seven-day Sabbath. If we obey these commandments, we're going to be in a good harmony relationship with the Lord. And if we obey the last six commandments, we're going to have a really good relationship with our neighbor, with our friends, right? So that's how... We understand, and the Bible tells us that one of the things that the law does is to bring harmony in, in God's kingdom. So you're saved by grace, but you still got to live in harmony. If you don't obey the law, you're not going to live in harmony. So doesn't it make sense, right? I, I know you understand what I'm telling you. It makes perfect sense. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, 
the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Know that Jesus has added, love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor. It's emphasizing that Jesus, when he was teaching the, the observance of the commandments, he was a bit stricter. Let's look at the, the other point. The next purpose of the law is to pinpoint, is to point to God's standard. The next one is to point to God's standards. The law was not evil. It served as a, as a mirror to reveal the condition of a person's heart against God's standards. So when you look at the law, it's like looking at a mirror. It tells you what's wrong. You get up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror, you know you got to take care of yourself, right? Something's got to be done. You know, wash, brush your teeth, wash your face, especially if you have hair, you have to comb your hair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the mirror is reflects onto you what is wrong with you. That's the same way that the law works. What shall we say then? I would not have known what sin was had not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if it, the law had not said it. You shall not covet. God has a standard, and he expects perfection from his people. Matthew 5.48 says, be perfect, therefore, we failed. We don't have the relationship that we need to have with God. There's too many of us walking out here in this world, and I say this sometimes very sadly because we want to live with God. We want God salvation, but yet, like I said before, we want to live our lives our way. And God is teaching us tonight that there's a, there's a reason why he has the commandments. There's a reason why he has his laws, right? By his grace, he forgives us and he declares us perfect. It's like a clean slate to start a fresh and hopefully not to stain again by breaking the law, right? It shows us God's standards. So do you see where grace comes in? We need grace because we have broken the law. So the law still is very much binding. The next purpose of the law is to prove obedience and loyalty to God. Think of the forbidden tree in the garden. From the human point of view, what was really the issue with eating the fruit? I don't think it's a big problem. Or at least in, in, in my human way of thinking, maybe there wasn't a big problem. But the issue is not the action of what you're doing is the issue. Is now, there were other trees of Eden. And he had no reason, she had no reason to eat from that tree. No reason, right? We mentioned this, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, where she should have never got anywhere near the tree, right? We talked about not playing with the devil. We talked about staying away from temptation. Don't get near something that you know is going to make you fall into sin. Don't get near it. Stay away from it. If, if there's something in your past that you know it's not, it's not going to be healthy for you spiritually, stay away from it. Um, one of the things that I confess, my wife is here, she can tell you, I, 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 I love uh, certain secular music. Um, I love the guitar. I love the guitar. And in Puerto Rico, they are, they are, there's um, romantic music that is played with the guitar. And I love it, but I, do, I try not to listen to it. Why? Because every time I do, it just takes me back to my old self. It takes me back to my old world. And I don't want to do that. Why? Because I want to live in obedience to God. Everything that you do in your life should have the purpose of connecting you with the Lord. Everything that you do in your life should have the purpose of, of making you a better, better person. And it, it should help you in your work with God. So it wasn't about that she ate of, of the fruit. It was the fact that she disobeyed the Lord. Amen. Let's talk about the manna. In, 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 in the desert with the Israelites, God said, you know, do not go on Friday, on Saturday and, and pick any because there's not going to be any. 
right? What did he say? On Friday, he said, go pick double the amount, correct? We're going to talk about this a little bit later on. Pick double the amount. Now, what is the big issue about me coming out of my tent, stepping out in the grass, picking up a piece of bread, and bringing it back in the tent? Is there a lot of work on that? Is there a big effort on that? Yes. You know why? Because it's called disobedience. See, this is what we need to understand, my dear friends, that when we decide to follow God, we have to decide to follow his rules and regulations. Amen. And a lot of times we just want to live life the way we want to live it. We don't want to live life according to God's will. Exodus 31, 17 says, it will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in he made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Exodus 31, 17 says to the Israelites, you must observe my sins so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Wants us, there's a lot of things that we need to understand about the Sabbath is that God wants us to learn to make a difference. We need to realize when we are we're transitioning from the week, from the regular week into the Sabbath. Amen. So God wants us to realize that because God wants us to keep his day holy. So it's not the action so much as it is the disobedient. We're going to learn this weekend that keeping the Sabbath goes way beyond physical labor, way beyond physical labor. At the beginning of tonight's message, we mentioned that there are two groups, remember? One group that says salvation is by grace and grace alone, and Christians are no longer required to keep the law. And the group number two says salvation is by grace, but Christians are still required to obey God's law. So I believe we have established that the group two is correct. Salvation is by grace, and we are still required to keep the law. Why? Because it brings harmony in the kingdom of God. Why would I want to be a Christian and not be in harmony? The Amaris will just stay out there in the world, right? I want to be a Christian. I want to come into God's kingdom, and I want to be in harmony. So that's what it does. The law keeps me in harmony. The law shows me the standard of God. And the law helps me to have a good relationship and a loyal relationship with God. Finally, the law shows how, in which direction we need to go with the Lord. So I want you to ask yourself tonight, as you meditate on tonight's message about the commandments of God, about the rules and regulations in the Bible, you know, if you come into God's kingdom, I'm pretty sure you want to have a different life than you have right now without the Lord. So uh, the invitation is that we want you to open your heart and your eyes to some of the stuff that we're going to be talking to, because we're still, this is like the halfway point. There's still a lot of other things that we're going to be discussing and sharing with you. And, and, and also I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Email us if you want more information on these messages, because what we're touching here is just the tip of the iceberg because there's so much information about each of the messages, but we just don't have the time. You know, the, the time is really not on our side to really discuss everything that we want to share with you about the commandments of God and about the law of God. So once again, we are saved by grace and it, it does not give us a free license to commit sin again, to disobey. You guys follow me? You know, we're saved by grace, and this is why we believe the Seventh-day Adventist church believe, because the Bible says it. The Bible says that we are saved by grace, but we still have to obey the law, right? Um, when a president pardons someone of a sin, that doesn't give that person permission to go commit another sin. Amen? So when Jesus pardoned us of our sins, that's not giving us permission for us to keep breaking the law. At the contrary, we should be grateful that he has forgiven us. And by keeping his law, we're going to be, we're going to be in a better position of gratitude towards his mercy and towards his grace. So the question is, are we freed from keeping the law? Because we are under grace, right? But we just discussed that. Paul says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Romans 6, 14 and 15. Sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Shall we sin? So Paul is saying, should we break the law? 
Because we're not under the law, but under the grace. He finished the Bible verse by saying, certainly not. And I bolded it and I highlighted it. I'm going to read this again. Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Shall we break the law? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. And Paul says, certainly not. So we need to understand that, that we are saved by grace, but we are still required by God to keep the law. We're still required by him to keep the law. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law, Romans 3.31. So grace, my dear friends, my dear brethren, is like the governor's pardon. If he forgives you, that doesn't mean that you are free to break the law again. And some of the pardons, I mean, some people have been in prison unjustly for 15, 20 years. I'm sure you, you guys heard of this. And they are forgiven by the precedent. They are grateful. I'm sure they're not going to go back and commit the same sin or, or sin again, period, because they want their freedom. The same way that the govern, governor gives a freedom to someone and he is not free to go and, and commit and break any laws, God has given us freedom today, right? He's given us freedom. In the Bible, the law refers to two sets of law that God gave to Moses. One is the Ten Commandments and the two are the ordinance. The civil laws, the ceremonial laws, the moral laws that govern the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. And that sets them apart from everybody else. And I want to tell you something tonight that the way the Seventh-day Adventists obey the Bible sets us apart from other religions. And I say that very proudly. And I want to make a parenthesis here. And I want to tell you that we are not here talking bad about no one. We are here telling you the truth as God wants us to tell it to you. I would be irresponsible. I would be irresponsible if I stand here and I tell you that you are saved by grace and you're free to do whatever you want. Whoopee, go live your life. La vida loca. No. That's not what the Bible says. We just saw what Paul said. Okay? We are not free to break the law. At the contrary, we need to enforce the law. I will be irresponsible if I stand here tonight and tell you that you can't keep the Sabbath. Keep worshiping God on the other day, Sunday. We're going to find out this weekend. So we need to tell you the truth as it is in the word of God. It is important to note that these laws did not save the Israelites. It is important to note that these laws will not save us. That's right. You hear me well. The laws do not save us. I'm so happy to share this with you. Because it is something that none of us deserve. Not you, not me. It doesn't matter the scholar. It doesn't matter how much education you have. You can have, you can have a, a, a PhD in divinity. You may know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That is not going to save you. What's going to save you is the mercy and grace of God. But God is asking you today and is telling you that if you make the decision to come into his kingdom... He has a set of rules and regulations he would love for you to follow. Because his kingdom is a kingdom of order. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 15 and 16, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance for to make in himself of two, one new man. So making peace, verse 6 that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. When Paul talks about the law that has been done away, he's talking about the ceremonial laws. He was talking about the civil laws. For example, when Jesus died, the Lamb of God because the ultimate sacrifice was already 
the Son of God, our beloved Jesus. As you come into God's kingdom, you're going to have the opportunity to deepen into these Bible studies. Like I said, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg for, to respect the time. But the main thing that we want you to understand today, that is God is giving you salvation by grace. And as you walk into his kingdom, he wants you to be obedient to his laws. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law. This is Jesus talking. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Till heaven and earth passes away, not one jot or one tittle will be by no means passed from the law till it is all fulfilled. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law like many people. Beyond the act of, of, of sinning to the mere thought about the sin, the mind, where it germinates from. He said, even if you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery. That's how important the law is to God and Jesus. That even with your mind, you can break the law. As we conclude tonight's message, in a brief and simple way that we try to explain this to you, we want you to understand that it is his grace and his mercy that is, is inviting you tonight to make a decision for the Lord. Tomorrow morning, as Pastor Bain said, we're having a feast here. But not just here, we're having a feast in heaven because we have some people that have decided to make the decision and follow Jesus. We want you to join us tomorrow morning. If you were going to miss a program, you should have missed tonight. You cannot miss tomorrow morning. You have to be with us. God, by his grace and mercy, forgives us and gives us another opportunity. It is by his grace and mercy that God is constantly, constantly trying to make a way for you to come to him. I believe that God probably would have came a long time ago, but he has been patient. He has been patient because you have not decided for him yet. He wants you to be saved. He wants you tonight to make the decision to walk with him. So take advantage of this opportunity and come and, 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 and accept his mercy and accept his grace. But understand that as you come to the Lord and as you live with God, you need to live according to his will. When the king of Medo Persia um, took over Babylon, he killed every, he killed all all the governors. He killed everybody except for Daniel. Daniel always had the favor of God because Daniel was always loyal to God. And they trick the king because the people of Medo-Persia was angry that there was someone that was not from their race in the position that Daniel was. And they tricked the king into saying that if anyone prayed to other other God that they will be put to death. And as we know the story of Daniel, Daniel used to pray a lot. He was connected with, with God constantly. So he prayed the way he always prayed with his windows open. And they saw him and they told the king. And the king had signed the law. The king had signed the law. So even though Daniel was his friend, he could not change the law. So they had to go forward with putting Daniel in the lion's den. Because the law of the land required because he signed the law. See, God made his law. His law doesn't change. His law are, are, are a reflection of his character. We've already seen that his law is to help us live peacefully in his kingdom. It, it, it shows us God's character and it helps us to live in harmony. And we have sin. We have to die. God cannot change the law. We broke the law. We have to die. 
So what happens? Daniel was put in the lion's den. But the king was worried and the king was wishing that his God would liberate him. And his God did. The Bible says that an angel came and shut the mouth of the lion and nothing happened to him. Well, the same thing happens with us today or similar. Because when we look at God's grace and mercy, I like to see it as an amendment of the law. It's not, but that's the way I like to see it, you know. An amendment is a way to modify in something that has already been written, but that cannot be changed. So it's, it's modified in a certain aspect. I'm trying to say this in a way you can understand. The law doesn't change. The law condemns us to death. But Jesus is giving you tonight mercy and grace. All you have to do is accept him. All you have to do is write on the text, I want to live for Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and write it as we close the message tonight. I want you to write it. I want everybody here to write also. I want to live for Jesus. But don't just write, I want to live for Jesus. I want you to mean that I want to live for Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. Take the opportunity, my dear friend, tonight. As we close tonight's message and accept his gift of mercy and grace, which is a sort of an amendment to his everlasting law. He can't change it, but he made a way where the law cannot condemn you. The law cannot condemn you because if the if it wasn't for his for his 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 mercy and his grace. We would have to die. But he, he, he made a way for us to live free from the law. That's what the Bible means. Because now we live on the grace. We live under his salvation and not the condemnation of the law. As Pastor Bing comes up here to have the final prayer, I want him to pray that God touches your heart. That you quit fighting with God. I know that there's somebody out there tonight. I know it. I feel it in my heart. There's somebody out there right now struggling, struggling to make a decision for God. Maybe you are somebody that a church member knows. Maybe you are a relative of someone here at Elam. I don't know. Maybe you, you, you are a friend of somebody in this church. Perhaps you know a seven-day Adventist. Or, or, or perhaps you, you used to be a seven-day Adventist. You used to walk with God for and you decided you didn't want to walk with God no more. Well, let me tell you, God is calling you back. I feel it. I feel that somebody out there, God is calling you tonight to make a decision for him. We want, we want to reach out to you. Please contact us. Rejoicing, rejoiceinhope.sda at gmail.com Rejoiceinhope.sda that sda at gmail.com we have the free call toll free number you can call us you can send us a private message through facebook you can send us a message through youtube just be honest with yourself quit fighting with the lord quit fighting with that decision that is burning your heart right now it's burning inside of you you want to come to god you want to take advantage of the mercy and grace because let me tell you there's going to come a point we don't know when but the revelation says that the books will be closed you know what that means when the books are closed that means that everything is done if you are just you will continue to be just if you are unjust you will continue to be unjust that means that if you have given yourself to God, you are sealed, you are saved forever. But if not, grace and mercy are over with. And that's the bad part about it, my dear friends. You do not know when the door is going to close. Noah, people out there didn't know. But when the door closed and the rain started coming from above and, and, and from below, it was too late for them. Pastor, come up and pray for us, please. As, as our pastor prays to close tonight's message, I want you to pray inside your heart and your mind also. I want you to pray that 
God can help you to make the decision for him. And I also want to make an appeal for you who are walking with God, who are part of God's kingdom. I want you to pray that God gives you the strength and the power to never, ever walk away from him. Don't let nothing in this world discourage you. There's too many things happening. The COVID-19, you know, we get sick, our family getting sick, and the devil is, is doing so much in your life to get you distracted. Don't let anything distract you because God will give you the power. All you have to do is go to him. Loving Lord, we come one more time saying thank you for the power of your word, the testament of your truth. Thank you for loving us so much that you yourself desired to give a love letter to us, which is your word, and more specifically, your laws of love help us lord to walk in the way of love you said it in your word if we love you we will keep your commandments lord as we focus on loving you that's the emphasis on the text. Loving Jesus. And then the commandments will come as a natural outgrowth of that love. We express our love to you by following your words. Lord, we say thank you tonight for clearly presenting this word through your man's servant, Pastor Perez, so that even a little child could understand it. Thank you for using him in such a mighty way. All month long, you have been giving him message after message for our hearts. We say thank you to the one that's watching and they have not given themselves to you. I pray even now, by the power of your spirit, Lord, speak to them. Trouble their hearts. Give them no rest until they say, yes, we will follow Jesus. Oh, Lord, tomorrow morning at 1030, we begin another meeting, another opportunity for somebody to give his or her heart to you. I pray, loving God, that you would put it in somebody's spirit right now to show up here tomorrow to come and be baptized somebody that's watching even right now, lord god almighty move them by your spirit and let them know that these words are true and faithful let them show up here moved by you oh lord to give it all unto you and to walk in your ways and keep your commandments. We say thank you to all of us that's a part of this Rejoice in Hope series. Help us to continue listening to these messages and living these messages and those who we love those who may not even love us may we still share the message with them may we hit the share button may we hit the like button may we hit the subscribe button even now so that we can get the message and 
others can get the message as well. Use us to draw others to you. And now, Lord, I pray that you would cover your manservant one more time. Give him a safe journey home. Bring him here tomorrow morning, refreshed, revived, ready to go. Likewise, all of us, bring us back into this place and this virtual space to hear your word again. And Lord, when you come, may our hearts be found faithful to go home and live with you forevermore is the prayer that I pray on behalf of everyone that loves Jesus that's watching tonight in his sweet name. I ask these blessings. Amen and amen.